For some time now, I've just really desired to take a few minutes to uh, teach about prayer, um, and I'll probably do this a couple other times this year, but just really burdened that as a church that we are a people that prays without ceasing. And so um, this is kind of an interruption of the series of the 10 most uh, popular verses in Africa, but this is a very well-known verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, where Paul, in, in the midst of a lot of rapid-fire statements, gives this exhortation, pray without ceasing. Uh, a brother in the church knew I was preaching on prayer tonight, and so he sent me some quotes that have been a help to him, and they're certainly very relevant for this topic tonight. Listen to uh, what 19th century Samuel Chaddick, Chadwick wrote. Satan dreads nothing but prayer. Activities are multiplied that prayer may be ousted. And organizations are increased that prayer may have no chance. The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies or prayerless work or prayerless religion. Satan laughs, out at, our to laughs at our toil he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Charles Spurgeon said, A prayerless church member is a hindrance. He is in the body like a rotting bone or a decayed truth, a tooth. Before long, since he does not contribute to the benefit of his brethren, he will become a danger and a sorrow to them. Neglect of prayer is the locust which devours the strength of the church. Anglican J.C. Ryle wrote this, Why is it that there is so much apparent religious working and yet so little result in positive conversions to God? So many sermons and so few souls saved. So much machinery and so little effect produced. So much running here and there and yet so few brought to Christ. Why is all this? The reply is short and simple. There is not enough private prayer. The cause of Christ does not need less working, but it does need among the workers more praying. The most successful workmen in the Lord's vineyard are those who are like their master, often in much upon their knees. In a well-known quote by Robert Murray McShane, he said, What a man is when he is on his knees before God, that he is and nothing more. So tonight I want to just kind of help us and motivate us as a church and practically instruct us concerning the matter of prayer, both individually and corporately. One, one of the most important parts of our church has for decades been that of corporate prayer. Uh, for years, we met in the balcony when there was a wall there on a Sunday evening uh, before the Sunday evening service. And then we outgrew that and we began to meet down here in the, in the hall, and we would have a lot of people come at half past five before the evening service at six. And then we made a decision many years ago just to incorporate our time of prayer with our evening service. And so our church service starts at half past five on a Sunday night, and we call it our, our prayer meeting. As the early church was characterized by praying together as a part of their corporate worship, which you read about in Acts chapter 2, and as well as when there was particular needs, which we began to read about today in Acts chapter 4, so our church should be characterized. We should be a church that is characterized by prayer, corporate prayer as well as special times of prayer when there are special needs. Every Sunday evening, we have anywhere between 14 and 20 prayer requests for which individual members will be asked to pray. And the prayers are short, but they are important. Remember the words of Jesus who said that we are not heard, we're not heard by God for our much speaking. But as people pray and bring the request before God, we believe that he hears. And this prayer meeting is one that we certainly prioritize and one that we protect to be a consistent time of prayer. It's important that church members pray together, but it's also important that church members are praying individually on their own praying in secret. Those corporate times of prayer are a time for us to uh, corporately bring our requests before the Lord, but it's also a time for us to learn as we listen to praying, as we learn how to pray. And so I want to share some things tonight that will help us 
in our corporate praying, but I trust will also help us in our individual praying in our closets. The verse we're going to look at is verse 17, pray without ceasing. There are only three words and there are only three points. The first one is simply this, that we are to pray dependently. And as I looked at this again this afternoon, I thought we should also be praying delightfully. Uh, I'm reading a book by Mark Jones, just began on Friday reading this book called The Prayer Life of Jesus, The Prayers of Jesus. And it's a brilliant book where he just goes through the, new, the Gospels and shows Jesus praying. And he makes the observation that Jesus himself prayed with, because he had great dependence upon the Father, but he also prayed because of a great delight in him. When well, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, which was, not a, which was a church that was no stranger to problems, when this church was planted in Acts chapter 17, we read that Jews rose up in opposition to the church, so much so that they had to send Paul from town. Earlier in this very letter in chapter 2, Paul commends them for their faithfulness amongst, amongst great persecution. And you would think that people undergoing persecution wouldn't need to be reminded to pray, but Paul, when he brings this letter to a close, says, listen, brothers, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Why is that? Because we are constantly in need of God. We are a people that are constantly, whether we realize or not, dependent upon God. Paul says, pray without ceasing. My good friend Franz Wall Koch and I used to have debates about this. He was of the opinion that this verse meant literally we were always to be at prayer. I would push back at that and say, that's dangerous when you're driving. It's dangerous when you're operating a lathe. I think, I think, by the way, on our roads, maybe you should pray while you're driving, but I don't think that's what Paul means here. I think what Paul is saying here, pray without ceasing, is this, make praying a habit in your life. We are to be praying without ceasing. One commentator puts it this way, this does not mean some sort of nonstop praying. Rather, it implies constantly recurring, recurring prayer, growing out of a settled attitude of dependence upon God. We're to be praying without ceasing. We're to be praying continually. We're to be praying time and again. We're to be praying frequently. We are to be praying like an itinerant prayer that as we have opportunity, we are praying. The Lord Jesus Christ, he prayed without ceasing because he was dependent upon the Lord. And as I just mentioned, he prayed without ceasing because he delighted in communion with the Father. In his humanity, Jesus did nothing apart from dependence upon the Holy Spirit and upon the Father. In fact, in our pneumatology class, we're going to look at this in our last class, the Holy Spirit and the life of Jesus. It's an incredible study that Jesus lived his life as the God-man dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit moved him to pray. He delighted in praying to the Father. He prayed because he was dependent. Paul himself, this great apostle, he constantly asked for prayers. And he often spoke of his continual prayers for others because he was dependent on God. He knew they were as well, praying without ceasing. The truth is, the truth is if we can go throughout the, the day without meaningful prayer, we're in trouble. Living in a world that is hostile to grace reminds us of just how dependent upon the Lord that we are. Our congregation is dependent upon the Lord. The Lord. It's always a disheartening thing. It doesn't happen a lot, but it's disheartening when there's a family of the week and we send out a request, what can we pray for? And we get back a response rather quickly, there, there's nothing we need prayer for. I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt there's not something in your life you need prayer for. If we really don't need the prayers of the church, then we're saying something else. We're saying something that's dangerous. We need the prayers of God's people. So we pray as a congregation, because as a congregation, we are dependent upon the Lord. Secondly, we are to pray deliberately. Paul says, pray without ceasing, 
But Paul wants them to pray without ceasing intelligently. I think that's what I called the sermon. Pray without ceasing with understanding. Sorry, I forgot the name of my own sermon. But I know the point of the sermon. That's the, the main thing. That we're to pray without ceasing with understanding. We're to pray intelligently. And so we're to pray deliberately. We're to think when we pray. We're to pray with discernment. We're to be careful as we pray. We're to pray specifically. You know, it's okay to have a prayer list. If a prayer list helps you to pray for some things specifically, do that. One reason I think that we struggle in our prayer life is we're not sure what to pray for. Have a prayer list. There are certain things every day that I, I pray through and pray for. It helps to have a prayer list. Um, and, and I remember Stuart uh, teaching on prayer from Matthew 6 some years ago. And he made a statement about what you can pray about. And he said something like this. He said, if it is large enough for you to be concerned about, then it is large enough for you to pray about. That's good. If it's large enough for you to be concerned about, then it's large enough for you to pray about. I love the saying, I forget who said it, but this wonderful saying, thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. Pray without ceasing. Pray deliberately. Pray specifically. Pray scripturally. Praying God's word is the most effective way to pray because you know you're praying God's will. Praying scripture. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I, I wake up and I'm carrying some burdens and I have a hard time going back to sleep. And I oftentimes just begin to pray through Psalm 23. You know, they say, when, they say that when you can't sleep, count sheep. No, talk to the shepherd. Talk to the shepherd. And I pray through Psalm 23, and I fill in the gaps in my own life where I need to, to be led to green pastures. Praying scripture. A large part of praying scripturally, by the way, is praying accurately. That is, praying as scripture reveals to us the truth. One of the things, and I want to be careful tonight because we're going to go to a time of prayer, and I don't want those who are I'm trying to think what time I started. I started a minute ago, right? Yeah. Um, as we go to prayer, I don't want people to be self-conscious and to think, uh-oh, we were just instructed about how to pray. Make sure I don't make a mistake. But can I just help us as a congregation that when we pray, we want to pray accurately. We pray to the Father through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think it's wrong to pray to Jesus. I don't think it's wrong to pray to the Holy Spirit. Certainly not wrong to pray to the Father. But sometimes we say things like this. We say things like, Father, thank you for dying on the cross for us. That's erroneous. When we pray, we need to stop and think what we're saying. Sometimes when we pray, we just kind of jump into it. You might notice sometimes after I preach on a Sunday morning, it's a it's a moment before I can actually pray because I, I want to think about what I'm going to pray. I don't want to just go through the motion because now it's time to pray. I want to, I want to think about that. So we, we make sure we're praying accurately. Uh, we, want to, we want to make sure that our requests line up with the scriptures. Let the prayers and scripture inform us to what we can pray. And I don't simply mean praying scripture, but think about the themes in scripture that are prayed for, the spread of the fame of God's name and Praying for spiritual illumination, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3. Praying for unity and, and health and church growth, spiritual and even numerical. Spirit, praying about spiritual struggles. You know, one of the most moving passages for me is it, it, those accounts in Matthew and Mark and Luke where Jesus is praying in Gethsemane. He's crying out, great sweating drops of blood, as it were. As he's in agony, he's struggling. He's struggling there about with the cross, and he's going to be rejected by the Father. When we're feeling a spiritual struggle, we should pray. We should pray for conversions. You know, I, I, every time we found out Jill was pregnant, which was lots, um, I would begin to pray for the salvation of the children. I pray for the salvation of my grandkids. I'm actually praying for the spouses of my grandkids. I have an idea. <laughs> I pray for the spouses. I pray pretty regularly, God, 
Let him marry godly spouses. And let him raise a godly seed. Who raise, raise another godly seed. Let there be a thousand generations serving the Lord. We pray about missions. Let the prayers of Scripture inform us when we pray. And I am running out of time, but here, just listen to this. And I just went through the Scripture this week and found some examples. Let the prayers in Scripture inform you when you pray. For example, when you rise up, when you go to sleep, when you're imprisoned, when you're barren, when you've sinned, when you're sinking, when you're in a storm, when you are persecuted, when you feel the Lord has forsaken you, when you are sick, when you are dying, when you need to be saved from your sins, when your loved ones are ill, when you want to praise God, when you gather with God's people, when you need wisdom, when you are in exile, when you struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, when you are burdened, when you need provision, when you are tempted, when you desire others to have spiritual insight, when you desire to know God's word, when you are confused, when you are afraid, when you are chastened by the Lord, when you are responsible to lead others, when, you, when laborers uh, are needed in the, in, the, in, the, in the mission field, when you simply desire communion with God, when you need to make a major decision, when others need to be restored, when doors are closed to the gospel, when you desire to strengthen the faith of others, when other Christians ask you to pray for them. All of that is in the scripture. So pretty much, it's easy to pray without ceasing. When you look at all those times when we can pray, pray without ceasing because, because the needs and the opportunities are without ceasing. And finally, pray devotedly. That is, when we pray, really pray. When we pray, let's again prostrate ourselves before God, not necessarily physically, but in our hearts that we're, we're laying ourselves before God. And we're thinking about God. We know we're speaking to God. We must be reverent when we pray rather than merely routine and certainly not mindlessly ritualistic. When we go to prayer in a few minutes, let's each of us say, you know what? We are coming to a king. We're coming before God. God, hear us. It calls again for being deliberate, for thinking when we pray, considering who it is that we are speaking to. We want to beware of transgressing the third commandment, which is thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, how many times have we, have we all been guilty of this? We just start praying because it's a thing to do, and, and we start using Lord as a pause. Well, Lord, mm, you think of something. And then, Lord, you know, I, I don't want to be hypercritical tonight, but if we're mentioning the name Lord and not thinking about that, we're taking his name in vain. When we speak to our Heavenly Father, when we use phraseology, make sure that, we are, that that is packed with biblical truth. Remember that as we pray, to think about the one that we are speaking to. And part of that reverence is coming to the Father in Jesus' name. You know that phrase in Jesus' name doesn't have to be prayed when you pray? It's an attitude of the heart that we're coming to the Father because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're coming to the Father and he's hearing us. We're his sons and daughters because Jesus Christ has died for our sins. He has saved us from our sins. He paid the penalty. As Tommy read this morning, the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, he's blotted those with his blood. And, Jesus, and, and the Father raised Jesus from the dead. He intercedes for us. So when we pray, we're mindful that we're praying because of the gospel. We're praying. Jesus said, you've asked nothing of my Father, but now ask in my name. That means we're authorized and we come with great reverence and great joy and great delight to the Father saying, Jesus said I can come. Jesus said I can pray. Jesus said I can bring these requests to you. And so as we pray tonight, let us pray um, deliberately. Let us pray dependently and let us pray devotedly. Let us pray without ceasing. Let us pray. Our Father, hear us now, please, because of what Jesus has done to make us your children. And we ask all these things for that reason, 
in Jesus' name. Amen.